Have you ever been out on the river and watched some other angler, probably an old guy full of old guy wisdom and rants about the youths of today, catch all the fish that seem impossible for anybody else to catch? The ones that refuse every single dry fly that you throw their way, but keep coming up to eat something that's just not your fly. Well, other than age and the need to pee every few hours, what's the difference between you and the old angler? Well, he's probably mastered a key skill. It's one of the most important in fly fishing. We're going to talk about that skill and a bunch more on today's episode of Untangled. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant. Excited to be here. And really happy that you decided to join us and spend some time with us today here at Untangled. Really appreciate it and really love the time that I get to spend with everybody. Uh, got a great little show put together for you. I, I, I always call it great or wonderful. I, I got to come up with some new adjectives. You would think that as an English teacher, I wouldn't have a hard time coming up with adjectives. But apparently, all my, excuse me, all my creativity has just been zapped. So that, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> but I'll come up with some new adjectives in the future, I promise. Anyways, we've got some pretty good topics to dig into. We're going to be talking about good beginning gear for those just starting fly fishing, what to do about bad guides, bad fishing guides, polarized sunglasses. We're going to talk about wings. I love it. Anytime I get to talk about wings is great. Uh, the best fly line for tricky presentations and when to know uh, when you need to step up in fly rod size. So a lot of different topics that we're going to dive into today. Should be a good one. Definitely want you to stick around and enjoy the whole show with us. Now, I do want to remind everybody, next week on episode 28, we're going to be announcing the winner of our Fly Rod and Reel giveaway. That's right, we're giving away a Fly Rod and Reel in case you didn't listen to episode... 26, I believe, is when we announced it. Uh, we're giving away to celebrate getting it to the thousand subscriber mark. We're giving away a fly rod and reel. So all you've got to do is subscribe to the show, follow us on Apple or on Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast. And then you're going to click the link in the podcast description and submit your email there. Once you've subscribed, you put your email in the link in the podcast description. That enters you for a chance to win the fly rod and reel combo, our fly flinger. So it's a great little rod. Uh, we'll be announcing the winner of that on next week's show. So you've got one more week to enter. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the show. Anyways, enough of our housekeeping stuff. Let's dive right into uh, the first of our short little questions. The first one comes to us from Canada, Brant from Canada. Now, I say this all the time that we get a question from a state or an area that's not common. And <laughs> I'm always like, oh, this is the first person from this place. And it turns out that it's not. Brent, I do think that you are the first person from Canada So, if, who's, whose question I've read on the show. So if, if you're not, I apologize to whoever the first Canadian was. I think it's Brent. Not 100% sure. Anyways, Brent writes in and says, what is some good beginner gear? Well, that's a pretty broad question. What what gear are you talking about? Waders, boots, rod, reel, line, vests, the various accoutrements that go along with all of this stuff. Pretty broad question. And I, I do think that is one that a lot of beginning anglers have. They're like, well, what's I, I need gear. What's good beginner gear? Well, that's why we put together our starter pack here at VFC. We've got everything that you need except waders and boots. Uh, that you need to start fly fishing. So rod, reel, line, leader, indicators, nipper, split shot, a sling pack, tippet. It all comes in our starter pack. I've left a link for it in the podcast description if you want to take a look at it. It's a pretty pretty cheap way. When you look at everything that you get, it's a pretty cheap way to get into the sport, see if you're actually going to like it. I mean, that is one of the tough things about fly fishing is you want to try it, but you don't know if you're going to like it. So how much do you want to invest? And we try to get the starter pack to like hit that sweet spot of, hey, you can invest this much. And if you don't really like it, you're only out this much money. It's not, it's certainly less than 
you know, getting the gear from some other place. So that's that's what I'd look at uh, just for some beginner gear. Brant, take a look at what we've got in the VFC starter pack. Again, there's a link to that in the podcast description. Thanks for writing in. Appreciate it. Now, our last uh, short question before we dive into the meat of the show, Robert from New Hampshire writes in. He says, what do you say to a guide that forces his client in front of you? The poor client was embarrassed when he realized what the guide had done. <laughs> oh, well, honestly, in this situation, I I go back and forth, right? Because you can say something and you can not necessarily make a scene, but you, you can you can let them know. And there's a way to do it where you're not being a jerk. You can let them know, hey, uncalled for, not doing this. You, you, you should not have done that. And the guide, the guide knows better, right? But sometimes guides make bad decisions, and it sounds like that's what this guide did. Uh, honestly, though, I, <laughs> 10 years ago, I would have said something. I would have got into something with the guide. I would have made a big to-do about it. Now, I just wouldn't say anything. Just... <laughs> Just don't say anything. If you do, though, opt for the kind of kill them with kindness <laughs> approach a little bit. Something like, ah, I, you must be a really new guide. Uh, usually, you know, us anglers try to give each other room. I, so in the future, it'd be really good if you just remember to, to do that. Thanks. Have a great day. If that's all you say, it lets the guide know that, hey, you were completely out of line. And I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, calling you a noob. And he's probably not, or maybe he is. I don't know, but it's it's a very non confrontational way to have that conversation. And I think I think that if you're gonna say something, that that's a good way to go with it. Uh, it's just really not worth getting into anything with people. It's just that I don't know. For me, it's not. But and I, I think in this situation, the best way to get back at a guy who's doing something like that is just keep fishing where you're at and completely ignore them because it's going to make things super uncomfortable, right? The client's looking at you, going to look at the guide. He's probably going to say something. If you just keep fishing, the guide is probably banking on you being uncomfortable and leaving. It's probably what he wants. So if you just stay there and fish, it's going to make them uncomfortable. I bet they leave pretty quick because the client's going to realize, Hey, that's, that's not good. So that's what I do in that situation. And just remember, not all guides are like that. It's unfortunate that there are guides out there who will do those things. Uh, but at the end of the day, all guides and all of us as anglers need to remember, it's not all about catching the fish. It, if it was, we'd be out there with worms because that's a way more effective way to catch fish than flies. I, some people might try and argue that with me, but I I. I think worms are way more effective than a fly. Worms and power bait, you can really reel them in. Now, that's not 100% true all the time. And some people say, oh, well, you just don't fly fish well enough then if worms are better for you. Well, maybe. But if it was all about catching, if it was all about catching fish, let me put it this way. If it was all about catching fish, we'd just be out there with a net seen in the river up, right? That's what we'd be doing. So we need to remember that it's not all about catching fish and we need to, not put that pressure on guides to make them feel like we've got to have a 50 fish day for them to have earned their tip because it's not always good for the fishery, right? There's a lot of issues going on in Southwest Montana right now with their fisheries of the big hole in particular trout numbers have plummeted. And a lot of people are trying to hang that on the increased guiding pressure and folks going out there and having 20, 30, 40 fish days. Well, I'm no expert on the issues facing the big hole right now, but I know that's not the only reason that trout numbers have declined, but it's certainly probably playing a role, right? I I see that in places that I love fish where the increased pressure has led to decreased fish size. It happens, right? So I think as anglers, we need to remember that it's not always about how many fish we put in the net that makes the day a good one. So just something to hang, uh, hang on to as we keep on fishing. I appreciate the question there, Robert. And with that, let's move on into the meat of the show. All 
All right, first question comes in to us from Emma. Emma from Washington writes in and says, Hi, Spencer. My husband and I are new to fly fishing, and your podcast has been an invaluable resource. Thank you. Also, Pepsi is way better than Diet Coke or Coke Zero. Emma. Emma, that's party foul right there. I, I will not stand for such slander. Pepsi is not better than Coke. The only good thing Pepsi has going for it is Mountain Dew, and I will die on that hill. Anyways, we'll, we'll, finish, your, we'll finish your question here. <laughs> Emma says, two questions for you. First, I know polarized sunglasses are necessary for fly fishing. However, not all polarized lenses are made equally. Do you have a recommendation for lens tint color for different water surfaces? Secondly, you speak a lot of wings. Have you compiled a list or map of your top-rated wing places in relation to fishing spots? You should do this. Thanks for your time. Emma, I'm not going to lie. This is probably the best question that we've ever received on Untangled, except for the, the Pepsi thing. I almost quit reading when you said that Pepsi was better than Coke, but then you went and totally redeemed yourself. <laughs> Oh, I I have not put together a map of good wing places in relation to fishing. I think that is a worthy endeavor, though. And I will have to say, I think uh, Buffalo, New York might, well, not but Niagara Falls might top the list there because the Niagara River, really good fishing, and you're close to a whole bunch of good wings. So that might be top of the list. But that's an interesting project. I think I think uh, I think I might have to to. Uh, to initiate that. And I actually had wings today, by the way. It was wonderful. So nice, nice big helping of wings while I was out and about getting things done today. But enough about wings. I could I I need I need a whole podcast about wings. Maybe I'll start that too. But we're gonna get back into the fly fishing side of things. So first off, my favorite sunglasses that I'm that I use are uh, from Bahio, it's the Rose mirror lenses. Those are my my current favorite, but the copper mirror lenses from Costa are very, very close second. I really love the Rose mirror lenses from Bahio because the strain on my eyes is a lot less with those. It, it, they're just a lot easier to look through. I, I love them. They're, they're just very pleasant to wear. But again, the copper mirror lenses are a super close second. Uh, Smith makes a really, really good polarized lens for fishing. Their chroma pop lenses are great. I've used them extensively in the past. I haven't used the new prism lenses from Oakley, but I do hear good things from folks who have. So I don't think you can go bad with, uh, glasses from any of those companies. I've used Rios sunglasses as well. They, uh, R H E O S. I might be saying it wrong. Uh, Rios or Rios, however they they want to say it, they're the floating sunglasses, and they're 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 great for their price point. They're not very expensive sunglasses; they're pretty solid as well. But you are right, Emma. Not all polarized sunglasses are made the same. Generally speaking, I've used copper or brown colored lenses my entire fishing career because that's just a good like general all purpose lens color for most fly fishing it works really well in both salt and fresh water now blue and green lenses those are typically used most often in salt water although i have used green lenses when i've been fishing on some glacial rivers up in alaska and they work really good there too i'm not the biggest fan of gray personally they're they're another good all-around lens but i just think it darkens things a little too much the brown's a little bit brighter which is really good for low light situations like early in the morning or late at night when you still need to cut the glare on the water, but you don't want to uh, switch to like a low light specific lens. That's why the brown is such a such a good one. Uh, if I had to pick just one lens color, though, I would opt for the rose mirror lenses from Bahio, but you can't go wrong with the copper mirror lenses from Costa either. Uh, the coastal lenses are, are fantastic. Again, it comes down to personal preference, and the eye strain is just a lot less with the rose mirror lenses for me. That's why I love them so much. Uh, it, it is pretty personal. I definitely recommend trying different lenses on to see which ones feel the best on your eyes. Uh, me, Alex, and Berkeley, we were just all out fishing oh, a week ago, a week and a half ago, 
And I noticed none of us wear the same sunglasses. <laughs> it's all different lens colors, different styles. So even among us who we all do the same type of fishing, we're using different lenses for it. So that'd be my two cents is go ahead and go try some different ones on. A lot of fly shops carry a lot of different sunglasses these days. So you can definitely go pick some up there. But um, I thank you very much. Great question. I appreciate you sending that on in. For our next question, John from the UK. Now, John certainly is the first one from that side of the pond to write in. I know that. So that's awesome. Uh, John writes in and he says, how or what is the best type of fly line that you recommend for the ultimate presentation, be that dry or wet, in a reasonably shallow, slow-moving river? The reason I ask is that the fishing I do is the reality of the ultimate wild fishing for brown trout in an overgrown river, and of course, the fish are very easily spooked. I cannot even wade in the river as they vanish to the depths no matter how gently I wade in. I come from an old school method after a long hiatus from angling of using a double taper line, whereas these days it is all weight forward that is supplied with most kits as well as what is on most retailers' shelves. Weight forward was a niche and specialist area when I first started in fly fishing. What are your thoughts on this? I know this is a multiple question. Well, John, don't worry about the multiple question thing. This is a wonderful, awesome question. And Again, thanks for being the first to submit a question to us from across the pond. I think that's really cool. Uh, I'm going to answer your fly line question first, but it sounds like you're actually kind of touching on another topic altogether, which is the topic that I teased in the opener to this show. And that is the skill that makes a difference for tons of anglers, which is presentation, right? Your fly line in the situation that you're describing matters a little bit, but... What matters more is how you present your fly, right? Presentation is everything in fly fishing. You can fish the wrong fly, but if you fish it well enough, it doesn't matter in a lot of cases, right? That's not always 100% gospel truth, but presentation does matter that much. So let me, before I dive into the presentation side of things, I'm going to answer the fly line part of your question, and then we'll jump back into the presentation part of it. So weight forward is kind of our go-to fly line these days because fly rods are a lot faster action now than they were back in the 80s, and weight forward lines load the rod a lot better. And for those of you who don't know, before I get going too too far into this, weight forward lines, they're the most uh, prevalent kind of lines that we use today, and they have most of the mass of their fly line in the front part, or what we call the head. It's usually like the first 30 feet or so of fly line. Thus, they get the name weight forward because all the weight of the line is forward. It's in the front part of the line. A double taper line has the mass of the line very evenly distributed throughout, so there's no aggressive amount of weight to load up a stiffer fly rod. Double taper lines are known for being a lot more delicate. They mend exceptionally well, but there are a lot of really good way forward tapers that are excellent for fishing small dry flies too. I've got a couple of spools of like small creek specific fly line in in my desk where I keep on my fly line. Uh, but I, I do actually use double taper lines on my old Winston graphite because those rods are so much slower that the double taper lines coax the best performance from those rods. Those, excuse me, those rods were built for... Uh, they were built around those double tapering lines, so they just fish better with them than they do with the modern stuff. And again, I say this knowing full well that there are tons of fly lines that are built just for creek fishing or for fishing big bugs. Uh, What I really mean here is that a a general do-it-all wait-forward taper is going to be good enough for like 99% of your fly fishing, even in situations like John described for us here. For John, though, if this is the kind of water that he fishes a lot, which it sounds like it is, then it makes sense for him to invest in a specialized line just for that particular application. So what are you to do if you run into this situation without the specialized flood line? Well, that's where we circle back to the presentation side of things. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you all a little bit 
of a story. I was out fishing with Alex and Berkeley a couple of weeks ago. We were on a tailwater. And this tailwater is probably my favorite river that I have ever fished. It is, it's just a really unique fishery. The hatches are amazing. And the fish just get stupid over these flies, but they also get very, very selective because even when the water's up in the summer, the water's not terribly deep and the fish are very picky about the size of fly. It is one of the few places where uh, size and color matter just a ton. And when I say size, like they will eat your size 26, but they will ignore your size 22. It's that ridiculous sometimes out there on this river. And when we were out there, we were fishing the, it wasn't really the spinner fall. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of like spinners actually falling, but there were a bunch of dead mayflies and midges still on the water. And I was fishing with a silk line on my Tom Morgan, uh, Tom Morgan Rod Smith's eight and a half foot five weight. And that's just the perfect rod and line combo for that fishery because that double taper silk line gives it a beautifully soft presentation. It just kisses the water to borrow a phrase from my buddy, Ryan McCullough. Uh, it, the flies land like a butterfly with sore feet <laughs> with that rod. And I I thought I was doing great. Cause I had a nice, I had a, I had a size 22 on size 22 midge on the end of a pretty long light leader, but Fish were ignoring everything. And it wasn't until I stepped down to, I think I went down to 6X tippet. I uh, might have even gone down to 7. Yeah, no, I did go down to 7. I did. I, I stepped all the way down to 7X tippet and I increased the leader length even more. And when I did that, my presentation was better because there was very there was no more little micro drag because I was fishing a very still flat section of river. So the fish have all day to just sit there and like they can count the tail feathers on the fly and decide if they're going to eat it or not. And it wasn't until I perfected my presentation, I lengthened the leader and stepped down and tippet size that I started putting fish in the net. Once I did that, it was like a switch flipped and I was catching fish left to right. So that brings us back to the whole presentation side of things, right? Because I got the presentation right the fish decided to cooperate. So that's why this skill is so stinking important because, again, you can almost fish the wrong fly, but if you fish it well enough, you'll catch fish, right? And that that's not to say that the right fly doesn't matter. It does. But in a lot of situations, it is so much less pattern-dependent than it is presentation dependent. What I mean by that, I'll give you another example because it's not always just about like super tiny flies that you've got to worry about presentation or even dry fly fishing. that You've got to worry about presentation. When I was a kid in the Boy Scouts, my scout leader, Chad, he taught me a ton about fishing. I learned between Chad and my dad, I learned it was a first rate education in fishing but Chad's not a fly fisherman. He's a worm dunker and he's proud of it. And I think it's awesome for him, but he taught me a whole ton. We were on the scout trip. We were down uh, on some mountains in central Utah and we found this little stream. It was chock full of cutthroat and me and the other scouts, we were just beside ourselves. We were so excited because we could see the fish in there. And so we rigged up our spinning rods with worms on the end of them. And we were swinging them through the holes. And we were so certain we were going to catch these big old fish. But the fish would look and they'd kind of nibble, but they wouldn't commit to it. And we spent an hour teasing those fish with those worms. Couldn't get them to do anything. It was, <laughs> it was incredibly frustrating. We were really frustrated. So we go stomping back up to camp. And Chad's like, what, what's the matter? What, what, what are you guys? Where's the fish? And we're like, Chad, we can't catch them. And so we show him our rigs. He's like, well, let me look at what you're what you're fishing them for. And we show it to them. And I distinctly remember our knots were awful. There were giant tag ends hanging out of the knots. It just didn't look enticing at all. And Chad just looked at him and said, you think a fish is going to eat that? It looks ugly. Okay. 
the fish isn't going to eat something that doesn't look right. So he retied all of our knots. He showed us how to trim the tag ends off. He showed us how to make it look good. He walked back down to the stream with us. We threw the worms in. Boom. We caught enough fish for dinner that night. So that brings us back again to the presentation side of things. The difference between successful anglers and those who tend to struggle a lot is their ability to present flies properly, getting a good drift, eliminating drag, getting it down to where the fish are going to be. Right now with high water, I was just talking to my neighbor right before I came in uh, to do the show today, and he, he was out fishing one of our local tailwaters here, and his exact words to me were, hey, it was like you had to hit the fish on the nose with the flies for them to eat it because the water's up super high on this tailwater right now. I think he's 100% right. That's part of the presentation, though, is getting the flies where they need to be for the fish to eat them. So if you can master the presentation side of things, you're going to learn from those couple of stories I shared, you're not going to have a truly difficult time getting more fish into the net. That is the key skill that really separates the successful anglers from the folks that are really struggling with it. So hopefully that answers your questions, John. If you need more specific advice about fly lines, let me know. Uh, I think you're fine to use double taper line. Just, I, I it sounds like if if you're if you're in that situation, I would almost recommend the silk line from Cortland. Uh, it's a it's a great little line. It's not too expensive either. Really, really good for soft presentation. So, I take a look at that. And again, let me know if you've got any more questions or need some clarification on that. All right, wrap up the show today. We've got a question that came into us uh, from Iowa. Justin writes in and says, when or how do you determine when you need to step up your fly rod size when fishing? For example, as of late, I have only pan fished with my fly rod using small flies and nymphs and recently started using some larger woolly buggers and streamers for bass using my five, six rod. I seem to struggle. I have a seven, eight that was given to me, but I don't really like it. Am I underweight or possibly just a poor caster? The latter being the probable option. Thanks. Love the show. Justin, really good question. And thanks. I'm really glad that you enjoy the show too. Uh, Really, really glad to hear that. So when you step up in fly rod size, it's, it, you're, you're really doing that when you are changing the size of fly that you're fishing and, or the size of fish you're trying to catch. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples to try and clarify that. I like using an eight weight to fish for sockeye in Alaska, even though the fly that you use is really small. It's like a, well, at least the fly that I use <laughs> for my sockeye fishing is pretty small. I, I want to say it's like a, oh, like a two aught, and it's just a bare fly with a little bit of tinsel on it. The, the law in Alaska is. There's got to be something on the hook. You can't just have a bear hook. So it's it's a hook with a little bit of tinsel, but there's no like fur or anything on it. So it's a really light rig, like a, a five way to throw it fine. And, uh, but I use an eight weight for that because, not because the fly is so big, but because I need the eight weight to help wrangle the sockeyes, especially, I mean, you catch those sockeye close to the ocean and they are hot like me chasing down fresh wings, man. They just hook and they go. <laughs> All right, it, it gets kind of crazy the way that the way that they act when they get hooked. But you don't need a huge rod to throw those flies. I also like to really use a six weight for uh, fishing Dolly Varden in the Alaskan surf. Even though most of those fish are small, I think my biggest from the surf was like fifteen inches, and that's kind of overkill. The six weight's a little overkill for a fifteen inch fish, but I need it to throw my streamers out that far. So those are instances when you might size up the rod, not just for a bigger fly or just for a bigger fish, right? It, it's situational, just like so much else in fly fishing. But generally speaking, though, you size up your rod when you size up the size of fly that you're using. What you're describing here sounds like you need some practice casting, and I say that I said, I'm not talking down to you at all. All right, I promise. Nothing to be ashamed of needing practice casting. 
Uh, I feel that way every time I go streamer fishing with my buddy Ryan Kelly out on the Green River because he uses enormous flies, and I don't use flies that big, I'm really, unless I'm fishing with Ryan. <laughs> and uh, I always feel like a noob every time I go out with him because I, I have to almost relearn how to cast those big flies. So it, nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, the one thing to remember, though, casting big bugs, it's not very graceful. <laughs> it's certainly not as graceful as fishing dries or nymphs. So it's not going to look as pretty. The key is to open up your loops and pause a lot more. That allows the line to completely straighten before you start the next part of your, your casting stroke. I don't think that you're underweight using a six weight for bass streamers. Uh, unless you're throwing like a really, really big streamer. A seven weight's probably going to be overkill for a lot of bass fishing. Uh, an eight weight certainly is. Uh, and there might be folks who disagree with that. This is going off my personal experience here that, you know, about a six is really, really solid for bass. I, I would fish. I fished five weights for walleye and smallmouth down on Lake Powell. And I know, you know, smallmouth aren't necessarily as big as largemouth. Uh, but walleye get you know, pretty decent size. And we were fishing five weights for those. And it was, it wasn't, I, I didn't feel undergunned, uh, put it that way. Uh, a couple other things to remember when you are fishing these big streamers, though, you short, heavy leaders, get that five X crap out of here. All right. Go to like eight or 10 pound test and make sure it's like six feet long from the end of your fly line to the, the leader. So your, your leader should be about six feet long. Shorter leaders to help you turn over those bigger flies a lot easier. So that would be my suggestion. Focus on improving your casting. Go out to the park. Uh, just do what you can to improve that. And Pete Kutzer uh, from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools, in my opinion, he's the best fly casting instructor that I've seen. Uh, just really excellent at his job. He's got a great video on casting big, heavy flies, and I've linked that in the podcast description as well. So you can go give that a look. Highly recommend it. And with that, folks, show comes to a close. So thank you for coming along for the ride to listen to the show. As always, I really enjoy it. I really appreciate it. Love getting the chance to interact with you all every week. Please keep the questions coming in. If you've got a question that you'd like answered, there's always a link in the podcast description. You can submit them there, and I'll do my best to answer them and try and make you laugh along the way. Also, don't forget, subscribe to the show on Spotify or Apple. And then click the link in the podcast description. Enter your email for a chance to win the Fly Flinger and Reel combo. All right. I'm really excited next week to give that away to one lucky winner. But you've got to subscribe and enter your email. You've got to do both. Otherwise, you won't be eligible to win. All right. Uh, and, and with that, we're, we're going to say goodbye. Just remember to have fun. Go get out on the water this week. I know high water can be a little intimidating. But don't let it scare you out of not fishing, all right? Especially this year. It seems like the fishing's going very well in a lot of different places. If Instagram is any indication. But Instagram's a lie anyways, right? Who am I kidding? Shouldn't depend on that for a fishing report. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, until next week, tie lines, everybody. 